Hi, I'm Howie Rose, and welcome to One on One. And my guest today is one of the best second basemen the New York Mets ever had, and he has a gold glove to prove it. And uh, that is Doug Flynn. Doug, great to see you again. You too, Howie. And we really enjoyed you down at fantasy camp this year. Wasn't that fun? Yeah, because you didn't have to watch me play. I did that 30 <laughs> well, years ago. I can ago. say that about me too, so uh, I don't I know. I understand. I understand. But Doug is a regular at Mets fantasy camp. And if you want to have one of the weeks of your life, you'll get down there next spring in Port St. Lucie. But forget about looking ahead. We're going to look back now. Right. And I'm going to let you tell the story, because you've only been telling it for over 40 years, about the night that you were traded from the Cincinnati Reds <laughs> yep. to the New York Mets in probably, don't take this personally, it's got nothing to do with you. I know where you're going with this, Howie. The most infamous trade, okay? okay. I think that's fair. The Midnight Massacre. Yeah, yeah part of the Midnight Massacre. Yeah. But how did you find out and from whom that you were going to the Mets? Well, we were playing, I think, Phillies maybe or the Cardinals in, in Riverfront Stadium. You've been there. Uh, it's from third base over to the visiting dugout. It was very close, so Pete Rose was playing third. So I had my usual seat on the bench watching the big red machine play. and <laughs> It was very nice. It was a comfortable evening, I believe. And all of a sudden, Pete's very animated talking to the dugout. And you're thinking, what's he talking about? He's always talking, but why was he so animated? So he comes in, he sits down beside me, and he pats me on the leg. And I said, I'm gone, aren't I? And he went, yeah. I said, hmm, where am I going? He said, you're going to New York. So I'm thinking, all right, who's playing short and second for the Mets and the Yankees? I said, well, which one? He said, you're going to, to the Mets. Huh. I said, who for? He said, well, uh, Tom Seaver. <laughs> and very seriously, I looked at him, and I said, straight up? <laughs> <laughs> and Pete said, no. <laughs> it's going to be a gazillion dollars and four players, and then we all know the story of all four of us that came over here. But that's how I found out. It had already been announced on the radio, which we didn't know. And uh, so I found out. It was, you know, you, you get mixed emotions. Now it's the best thing that ever happened to me as far as a baseball player, and I'm very thankful for it. Well, let's rewind at least a couple of days before Pete broke the news to you because it was pretty evident that there was a chance that Tom Seaver was going to be traded. And mm -hmm. uh, really, it seemed to come down to the Reds or the Dodgers, and so there were plenty of rumors floating around out mm -hmm. there. Had you heard any of them? Did you think that you might wind up going to New York? No, because it was in the paper a day before, Flynn untouchable, because a lot of names were being thrown around. And I know now Johnny Bench said he had a lot to do with getting me out of there. And uh, I thought we were friends, but... <laughs> <laughs> but he did you a favor. The way no, he absolutely out. did me a favor. He said when they were coming down to have one more player, he said, why don't you put Doug in there? Because I'd been a utility player for a couple of years. I'd been a shortstop primarily in the minor leagues, played some second and short, you know, with Cincinnati. And he said, he looked around and he said, Doug, the reason we did it, because I wanted you to play. You weren't going to play here. He said, I knew Buddy and Felix were playing. They were a little bit older, and uh, you could go up there and have an opportunity. If you did the job, you could get a chance to play every day. I would think that you would have embraced that because you're a young infielder with the Cincinnati mm -hmm. Reds, and you come up to the big leagues, and you look at shortstop, and you see Dave Concepcion, and you go, oh, this might not be great. And then yeah. you look over at second base, and there's a future Hall of Famer in Joe Morgan, and oh, that probably won't work either. Yeah. So when you were traded, mm -hmm. even though it must have hurt, how enthusiastic were you when you bounced into the Shea Stadium clubhouse for the first well, time? Well, now, I'd been here as a player to play, so I knew it was a tough place to play. And as a visiting player, it can be really tough. So I also knew because of all of the media attention that was going on, being in the Tom Seaver trade was not a great thing. And it was hard for me to explain to some of the fans that I didn't make the trade. I was just, I was put in there, but I didn't initiate this. And we all know now that Tom was going to go somewhere. Uh, he was getting out of town because of all the stuff that was going on. So uh, Pete told me, though, he said, you need to embrace it. He said, you need to go up there with the idea that you're going to get a chance to play. And believe me, playing in New York is the greatest place in the world. He said, because if you play bad, your name's in the paper. And if you play good, your name's in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I came, uh, the fans, there was a few ugly letters that I got and some comments. but. You know, what both Joel and I realized, when, if you play hard in New York, they're very knowledgeable people. If you play hard, you keep your mouth shut, you own up to your mistakes, and don't try to alibi, the fans are very fair with you. And that's the case that happened. I wish we would have had better seasons and better records, but 
there was a lot of us that were young kids that had never been full-time players before they were getting an opportunity to play. So it was indeed an opportunity that a lot of us took advantage of and enjoyed quite and, a bit. You know, it's interesting, and Doug mentioned having been a shortstop in the minor leagues. Buddy Harrelson ends up getting hurt, and you move over to shortstop. This yeah. is right after the trade to the Mets. You played the heck out of shortstop. And did yeah. you ask at the end of that year to remain at shortstop? Because he ended up, what, trading for Tim Foley, I think, yeah. that winner? Yeah. But did you want to play shortstop? No. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to play, Howie. I, you know, when you've sat on the bench for a couple of years, it's great because, you know, we had really good years. But when you get into this game, the idea is to be in the lineup every day if you can. So uh, I didn't care where it was, second, third, or short. I hated third. Uh, I, I didn't like it at all. It was just not comfortable. And I loved being a little bit further away where I could analyze and get a better feel mm -hmm. for how the ball was coming off the bat. So short was good, but watching Buddy Harrelson play was always a joy. <laughs> to me, one of the most fundamental shortstops I ever saw. And he and Felix had such a career together. Uh, so when I got a chance to play short, and then the only reason I really moved to second is because we had that incident in Pittsburgh where Ed Ott and Felix had an mm -hmm. altercation, and Ed Ott hammered Felix to the ground, broke his collarbone, and I moved over to second. Matter of fact, to this day, all these years later, Felix says, I took one of his gold gloves. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was in 1980 when you won the gold glove, right? And there were mm -hmm. a couple of things that happened that year. Yep. The gold glove encompassing your work for the entire season. You had three triples in one game. Yeah, that's Tell weird. about that. That yeah. is really weird because you don't notice, I mean, <clears throat> think of me as, as having great speed or anything. I had some pretty good quickness, but speed was just probably average. But it, it's just one of those nights I hit a ball in the gap in Montreal. To They were playing me straight up, hit a ball in the right field gap for a triple, hit a ball in the left field gap for a triple. And the third time I get up, I didn't know there was any records involved with this. It was just I'm having a pretty good night. So I hit a ball, a nice little one hopper to Ron LaFleur in left field. Well, in Montreal, they had that track for football that ran out through left field. This ball hit the track, bounced over his head, and I eased into third base. So, And I actually got up for the fourth time, and I remember Gary Carter saying, Dougie, nobody's ever hit four in a game. <laughs> and I got all fastballs from Sosa, and I hit a ball right on the button. Nice little one hopper to short, double play, game over. All right, but you have the three triples. But I got the three to triples. To look back up. Yes, That's right. good. And 80 was a fun year, too, because yeah. it seemed like you guys were turning the corner. You yeah. had a big series with the Expos around July 4th. A big brawl took place that night, which sometimes unites a team. <laughs> but did you feel at, at around mid-season, 1980, that maybe you guys had a shot? I really did. I really thought we were on our way, and, and things through. hush. I really thought... The Who the heck asked Siri to butt in? Siri, chill. Do you want to hear the next five? No, but no. we'd like a couple of cheeseburgers and a Diet Coke, <laughs> if you don't mind. Who trust is that woman? Me, trust me, that phone was on silent. She must have heard something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I thought we were turning the corner. I, I really did because, you know, the pitching, we were getting the guy, and we were getting to play a little bit longer and play more consistently. And it just, uh, I remember, I don't remember one year we were thought we were really in the hunt right before All-Star break. We played the Phillies a five-game we were four games out, second place. They left, we were nine games out. No, I remember that. Just, it was, <laughs> Same so, summer. So, yeah, it, it's just, you know, those kind of things happen. But uh, we were still trying. They, we had so many good people on these ball clubs. And the guys that left here that treated us good when we got traded over, they knew it was a tough situation for us. But, you know, we heard when you interviewed Joel Youngblood, he had a glove for 14 mm -hmm. years. Well, mm -hmm. I had a glove that I used for seven of the 11 I played because Jerry Grody had made one for his son, who was only a kid. And I looked in his locker one day and I went, where'd you get that glove? He got it, took it to a shoe store, they cut it down to make it even smaller, and I put it on, I said, I'll give you two new ones for that one. Really? So I used it for the rest of the Well, you career. probably loved a small glove because it made the, the transfer glove. easier on the double player. Right? Much easier. Loved the small glove. Yeah, and even after the years I quit playing, I went to softball and played some pro softball. I couldn't get used to the big glove but the softball would not fit in my little glove, so I had to make a little transition. Now, I haven't told Doug this before. Uh -oh. He actually became one of my first favorites around the clubhouse because he was the first Met ever to get ticked off at something I said on the air. You'll love this. Oh, perfect. Come in one day, and Joe Torre says, hey, you better go see Flynn. He's kind of ticked off at you. I said, how come? He said, well, he listens to you in the morning because WHN was the country music station That's in it. New York. Yep. And it probably was late 77 or 78, and I'd said something on the air that morning when I was doing the schedule about, and eh, the Mets playing out the string are going to be facing the Cubs or whomever at Chase Stadium. <laughs> and so he says, 
Tori says, you didn't like that playing out the string thing. I go, oh, boo, I guess I got to go talk this out. And I'm kind of tiptoeing my way over to Doug. He goes, hey, Howie, what's going on? What is this playing out the string stuff? And we had the greatest conversation after that, and I thought you were going to bite my head off. So thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I never, man, if somebody reported that I stunk in a game, I know I stunk. Mm. That's okay, but don't embellish it too much. <laughs> and I don't know of any time where we're, we ever came and we went out on the field where we weren't trying. I mean, there's just games where it wasn't there. But it was never not hustling out a ball or one of those things. I don't, I don't think you can say we weren't bad, good and we didn't play, but there was a lot of us that we played hard every game. And the fans to this day remember mm -hmm. that. You know, they, And uh, going to fantasy camp has allowed me to really stay in touch with all of these great New York fans, and I meet a different group every year and stay in touch with a bunch of them. They appreciate it if you just go out, play hard, and if you make a mistake, say, I remember one game I had 80 something in a row without an error. And we're on national TV. You know, we only had one game a week. Mm -hmm. And you're lucky if you got on there, so we called it Game of the World. So we're on Game of the World, and Joe Garagiola and Tony Kubak are doing the games, and they said, Doug's got a streak going of 80 something. The National League record is 90 something. And the next ball hit to me, <laughs> I, it, I booted it. And it wasn't a hard play. So I remember the writers coming up and they're going, all right, you got to tell us what happened on that. And I went, it hit everything but my gloves. And they went, well, what happened? I, I missed it. I got nothing for you. Yeah. I missed it. Well, that was it. There was nothing, nothing said. Well, that's accountability. And, and that's, that's accountability. And that's what, and Joel was my accountability partner too. Because when I'd come back at the, sometimes at the plate and I went, that pitch was low, and he'd be laughing. He'd go, the pitch was so good. How do you, <laughs> how do you not swing at that? So, and I think every player needs to have that because uh, in the game's so different now, but good night. We were so fortunate to play in the big leagues and to play in New York mm -hmm. in the big leagues. I can't imagine, you know, Frank was right. You can make it here, you can make it mm -hmm. anywhere. Well, it was a growing up year for all of us, and we're both just uh, – to Joe Torrey for giving us a chance to play every day for the Mets franchise, and it's an honor to be here. Man, and I, to come back and to see Jay Horowitz. Well, comes with the furniture, me? right? It, it, it is. <laughs> well, the furniture looks better than Jay does, but it really <laughs> is good to see Jay Horowitz. You bet, and he's done such a great job bringing the alumni back. Mm. And one of the things that I mentioned a moment ago having to do with country music yeah. is a real passion of Doug's. Yeah. And when he was here, there was a place called the Lone Star Cafe downtown, which was a great place. Mm. You perform. You didn't just go there and eat chili and listen to music. You no. performed there, did you not? We came up here one night. Who's uh, we, by the way? Well, it was 1980. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is a good <laughs> bunch of we's that came up here. <laughs> we loaded up 18 of us from home. Well, when they called me and said, it was a place called Cody's, too, mm -hmm. which is a country place. And they said, would you come up and uh, perform? Well, all I was doing was backup singing with the group. Joel's heard our group. And... I was just singing back up and having a good time. They said, we want you to headline. And I went, hmm. So I called my buddies and they went, God, I don't know. But I said, all right. So I called Dave Thornhill, lead guitar player for Loretta Lynn's group, the Coal Miners, country music group of the year for four straight years. I said, Dave, I want you to come with us. Can you figure up some music and kind of arrange a few things? He went, I'll do better than that. I'll bring up the whole group. Uh, I'm only making like $2,000. I can't afford to do that. He said, can you give us $50? And I said, I'll give you the whole $2,000. I just, he said, all right. So we loaded up Winnebago's cars. We had a caravan coming up. It was so cold. And we went down and filled that bad boy up. And uh, matter of fact, I signed my five-year contract down there, thanks to Mr. Horowitz. He got Frank Cashin to come down and put a cowboy hat on and we signed the deal, and uh, you know, as a matter of fact, as you say that, I look back now in the last week, or the last month, I've seen the Oak Ridge Boys, the Gatlin Brothers, and Gary Morris, all in the last, because I still love it, and I still love the music, and every now and then I get up and sing a little bit. You just created an image, though, of Frank Cashin in a cowboy hat. That must have looked like Yosemite Sam in a bow tie, right? <laughs> That's exactly what we say. <laughs> it might have been why he traded me the next year. What, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what was more intimidating, playing in front of 50,000 people or singing in front of a few hundred? Uh, probably singing in front of a few hundred. Because, <laughs> you know, when you get out on the ball field, after you after you play in for a while, you, you don't even hear the airplanes, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just... If, if you're into it, when you start hearing things, that means your head's probably not in the game. And well, uh, so it was a little intimidating. Uh, Doug Flynn's head was in the game for a long time as a member of the New York Mets from 1977 through the end of the 81 season. We'll see you in fantasy camp, but it's always great to see you here in New York. Thank you, Howie.
Doug Flynn, my guest. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.